For the longest time, I would imagine how cool it would be to have a Pokemon fighting game. All the tools were right there, hundreds of cool Pokemon to choose from, and limitless potential in how the game could be played. On August 26, 2014, we got a teaser trailer that would blow our minds. Set for a 2015 arcade release in Japan, we got a first look at a Pokemon fighting game developed by the team that brought us Tekken. Tekken! What's it gonna play like? Was it gonna be Tekken but with Pokemon? A traditional 2D game like Street Fighter? Was it an arena game? Time passed and the game would release in Japanese arcades on July 16th, 2015, with another trailer releasing two months later on August 21st, 2015, telling us that the game was coming to Wii U in Spring 2016. For those of you who didn't want to hunt down footage of it in the arcade, it wasn't until that second trailer that you'd find out that Pokken was going to somehow be both an arena fighter and a 2D fighter. The wait for Pokken to come to console began. The game would launch on March 18th, 2016, and we would have in our hands a beautiful fusion between arena and 2D gameplay. Pokken has gameplay unlike any other fighting game while still having a certain familiarity that helped bring in newcomers and veterans alike. It used a phase system split between the field and dual phases. The field phase is your standard arena fighter style gameplay. You have complete free movement being able to approach as you see fit. The dual phase is its opposite, an environment with limited movement focused on letting each Pokemon shine at what they do best. In the field phase, your controls are quite simple. You have your weak attack on the Y button, having different results depending on what direction you're holding before pressing the button. The X button was a homing attack. Pressing the button would make you do a straight B line toward the opponent to perform an attack. You do have the option to stop your run by pressing the block button, which was located on the right bumper. On the A button, you have the Pokemon Move button, but I'll simply be referring to them as special moves. The B button is your jump, and on the left bumper, you have your support Pokemon button letting you call out whatever support Pokemon you had selected. Once the synergy bar, this bar next to your health, is full, you can press both bumpers to activate Burst Mode, a powered up state for most Pokemon and an install for some. By pressing the bumpers again, you unleash a Burst Attack, which is what the game calls its supers. In the dual phase, all controls stay the same except for your homing attack. Within this phase, it loses the homing property and becomes a direct partner to your light attack, a strong attack. Similarly to the light attack, it changes depending on what direction you're holding on your stick. These are the controls you must become familiar familiar with when you pick up the game, but what about the phases? How exactly do they affect the way you engage with your opponent? The field phase is where you start each round, so let's go over it. The field phase is basically the neutral you play at the start of the round. This is where each character has the same goal, to cause the phase to shift in their favor. Zoners will want to shift into the dual phase with the opponent far away and easy to keep out. Rushdown characters will want to get in and shift into the dual phase while on top of the opponent, ready to force a favorable sequence. To put it simply, the field phase is where you'll want to spend the least amount of time, but even saying that, you still might spend a lot of time here as you and your opponent will want to be on your toes, evading every attack trying to be the one to cause a phase shift. Once you enter the dual phase, it's important that you force a situation favorable to what your character wants to do. A Chandelure player will want to have caused a phase shift from far away during the field phase so that they can focus on keeping the opposing Pokemon out of reach. 
A rushdown character like Blaziken, though, will want to make sure they cause a phase shift with a move that doesn't accidentally launch the opponent too far away, or else they'll have a soft reset to neutral within the dual phase. The dual phase allows for cornering, so unlike in the field phase, once you find yourself next to the stage's wall, you'll be limited in ways to escape. Some characters will melt in the corners, but others with mobility and good buttons will be able to try and fight their way out. It also helps to understand what your Pokemon can and can't do, so let's actually do a bit of a lightning round and go over the game's roster. Who are they and what do they do best? We'll start from the top left and work our way down left to right, so let's get started. Darkrai is a non-traditional zoner, relying on getting into his Bad Dreams Rising an enhanced state that makes him go from mediocre to a force that can fight anyone, anywhere. He excels in the field phase, but is average in duel. Darkrai requires you to make obtaining BDR your first priority, as obtaining it means your opponent is now playing your game. Blaziken is a fast-paced, high-action, glass cannon rushdown character, whose goal is to get on the opponent's face and overwhelm them with safe or even on-block pressure. He has a quite unique mechanic where holding down the A button when doing a special will enhance its properties but cause recoil damage in return, turning his own health bar into a resource to maintain. Pikachu is an all-rounder with effective rushdown and decent zoning. There isn't much to say about Pikachu as all-rounder characters are rarely insane at anything. Pikachu does, however, have a Tekken reference in Dual Phase as his forward or 6Y is a Wind God Fist. With correct timing, he can also do an Electric Wind God Fist for more damage and longer combos. Lucario is also an all-rounder, more akin to the Shoto archetype, like Ryu and Street Fighter. He's great for beginners as he has his own versions of Hadouken, Shoryuken, and Tatsumaki. He has all the tools you need to get started in learning the basics as he plays a very simple footsies game. Gardevoir is a zoner. She can keep you away and place traps to make you hesitate on trying to engage. For a zoner, she has pretty good combo damage, but don't let that cause fear as her defense is non-existent without a charged up support Pokemon to get you off of her. Pikachu is an all-rounder who's a jack of all trades but a master of none. Pikachu Libre, on the other hand, is a crazy rushdown character with insane blowups and a tick throwable command grab. She may have stubby normals, but when she gets in on you, you best be on your defensive A game. Scizor is an evasive mid-ranger with long-reaching attacks from mid-screen and an abusable amount of safe moves up close. Scizor even has a hover at stance to add to the mobility and can be chained into off of counterattacks. This character requires a lot of proper execution and once mastered is an unstoppable force. Aegislash is a unique stance character focused on a game plan of continuously maintaining his positive stat buffs. He boasts monstrous damage and crazy normals, but without the maintained stat buffs will fall flat and become one of the weakest characters in the game without a proper game plan. Krogunk is an unorthodox character comparable to Cat. He's designed as a joke character, but has some of the craziest movement in the game with okay damage and an annoying amount of chip. Skeptile is a high mobility character that loves to lock down the opponent. He excels at converting any stray hit into good damage and loves to set up bullet or leech seeds and delayed traps that the opponent must respect. Skeptile also likes to harass the opponent with far-reaching attacks. Gengar is quite an unorthodox character with moves that perform somewhat of an air dodge, punishing people who try to press a button without knowing the proper timing. Gengar also has an install of sorts as when in burst mode he transforms into Mega Gengar. Unlike other Megas in this game, this one isn't a powered up version, but almost entirely different character, with huge safe hitboxes and a high damage super in the game turning any Gengar master into your sleep paralysis demon. Decidueye is a fighter with a flight stance that allows for devious mix-up and insane mobility that make him a nightmare for taller Pokemon. He has simple yet powerful setups and good frame data that makes him a contender for best in the game. Machamp is a slow, hard-hitting truck with damage so high he'll isekai you three times over. He's pretty much the grappler of the game with a powerful command grab. He also has the special move Bulk Up, which increases his damage to be even bigger than it already is. Brakeson has great zoning, great combos, and access to an air dodge. She has the ability to cancel her moves into support Pokemon, allowing her to make any form of pressure safe and turn stray hits into combos. She also has Sunny Day, which enhances her special moves to be more powerful. Empoleon hides astonishing mobility and immense power under his chunky frame. He can control the pace of a match with a sliding stance that allows for good offense or a fast escape. He has great chip damage, giving him an easy time to increase or close any life leads. Blastoise is a low mobility tank of a character who loves to play the mid-range game with long-range attacks, absurd chip damage, and high survivability. He can self-buff his own defense while already having the highest HP in the game. Good Oki and pressure tools sadly aren't enough for his bad frame data. 
Mewtwo has strong defensive tools that allow him to control the pace of the match. Mewtwo is most comfortable in the mid-range, and while he doesn't need burst mode, he still has attacks that help fill the bar, as it is one of the hardest to fill up in the game due to its size. Just know that if Mewtwo manages to charge that large bar, it's time to pray once he bursts. Chandelure is an honest to god zoner. Her game plan is focused on keeping the opponent away at all times with attacks that go full screen, can pierce counters, debuffs, synergy draining attacks, and a long range command grab. She even has a frame 1 and vulnerable anti-air, making her very infuriating to fight against. She does have a poor defense game, so she's quite easy to blow up. Suicune is a defensive mid-ranger with some fair presence at full screen and close range. She has several mid-range attacks that can be cancelled as feints to force your opponent to open themselves up for a punishment. Suicune basically likes to focus on controlling the space of the map. Weavile is all about speed, with a focus on being evasive and locking the opponent down with safe pressure. He likes to set up traps in field phase to gain synergy and can also take away from the opponent's synergy gauge. Weavile will dismantle a zoner and force all to deal with having no burst mode to access. Charizard is a grappler. Unlike Machamp though, he has the ability to glide, making him surprisingly mobile for a character of this type. He has fast pokes and several links to aerial attacks. He has a high execution barrier, but is worth the trouble if you want a grappler that is more threatening due to mobility. Garchomp loves to be in the opponent's face. He uses the attack grab counter triangle concept to the max, with specials that have unique properties based on which of the three options it's strongest against. Garchomp gains a lot from callouts and hard reads, being able to end a round in a single duel phase. Shadow Mewtwo is the final boss archetype of the game, with an oppressive field phase and an overall game plan that abuses the fact that he is tied for having the smallest synergy gauge in the game. He has a powerful moveset, including the move Miracle Eye, that can have different effects like reversing projectiles or summoning mirrors. It's basically a setup or trap. To balance his power, he has the lowest health in the game and certain moves that can cause recoil damage. He is the definition of a glass cannon, but even with the lowest HP, is still one of the strongest characters in the game. With the roster out of the way, we now have the second most important section of the selection screen. Support Pokemon. I certainly don't want to go over all 30 of them, so I decided to consult the community discord to find out if there's a common consensus on the top 10 supports. There is not a common consensus on the top 10, but there is a top 2, so I just used our conversation in different contexts to pick out 8 more Pokemon I can go over. Firstly though, there are 3 types of support Pokemon. Attack Pokemon. They attack, they deal damage, but some can also give buffs to you and or debuffs to the enemy on top of the damage they inflict. Enhanced Pokemon are used to give yourself useful statuses and other effects. Disrupt Pokemon are like enhanced Pokemon, but instead of helping you, they screw over the opponent, whether it be debuffs, taking up space, or interrupting combos. It's also worth noting that each support Pokemon has different charging times before they can be used. Getting back on track, here's a quick overview of 8 pretty good supports and 2 really good supports. There's no specific order here because all supports are good in certain matchups and bad in others. Anyways... Mimikyu is a disrupt Pokemon with an average charge time. They launch an attack near the opponent, causing a 20% decrease in attack power and a decrease in the stat bonuses of burst mode. Dragonite is a slow charging attack Pokemon. Over a wide area, they perform a multi-hit attack that opens up the opportunity to close in. Magneton is an attack Pokemon with an average charge time. It performs a long distance attack that hits diagonally upward. It also causes two random negative effects. Latios is a disrupt Pokemon with a fast charge that can only be called once per round. He surrounds the opponent with some light pillars, restricting their movement and causing a 20% decrease in defense. Umbreon is a disrupt Pokemon with a slow charge time. He launches an area attack that absorbs the opponent's synergy gauge and temporarily removes the opponent's ability to get a critical hit. Eveltal is an attack Pokemon with a slow charge. He fires a destructive beam from the skies that prevents the opponent from using their synergy gauges as well as making it charge slower for a short time. Victini is a slow charging enhanced Pokemon. He temporarily makes all your attacks cause critical hits as well as recovering a small amount of HP and charging a small amount of the synergy gauge. Lapras is an attack Pokemon with an average charge speed. They attack with a wide and powerful charging attack that can nullify some long range attacks. Snivy is a fast charging attack Pokemon. He launches a powerful anti-air attack making him useful against people who like to jump. Magikarp is a slow charging disrupt Pokemon that's extremely useful. He's used to interrupt an enemy's combo while also causing a 50% decrease to the opponent's movement speed and dash range. Overall, these are some of the cooler support Pokemon, but if you're interested and don't own the game yourself, I've left a link to a Google Doc below with a description about what each of the 30 support Pokemon do. Cheer skills are the final game changers, and there's 6 choices that will affect how your game goes across the rounds you play. 
Standard has different effects depending if you won or lost. Winning fully charges the support Pokemon you did not choose, but upon a loss, both your support Pokemon are fully charged and your synergy gauge fills up by 30%. It's great if you play a support set where both Pokemon are great, but fall short when you only use one. The synergy cheer focuses on, what do you know, your synergy gauge, increasing it every round. Winning nets you a meager 10%, but losing gives you a tasty 40% fill. This cheer is best for characters that rely more on their burst mode than supports. The pressure cheer is a risk reward as it only activates in a final round situation when the pressure is on. Eh? Eh? Get it? <laughs> it fully charges both supports and gives you 30% synergy. This cheer is best for characters who have a strong synergy burst, especially for Pokemon with larger meters. Simple yet effective, the support cheer readies both support Pokemon after every round. It's great if you plan on using supports with a slow charge time. The special cheer is a mix of the synergy and support cheers. It gives you a massive amount of 40% synergy upon winning the round, while giving you two fully charged supports upon a loss. Finally, we have the RNG-based cheer, the Whimsical cheer. It activates before the first round and every round after. I won't go every possible combination of support and synergy effects, so here's a graph made by Combo-Ster. Basically, it's different chances of getting synergy, one or two supports, nothing or everything. As for stages, to keep it simple, they are mostly varying sizes of circles with a few oval stages thrown in there. The size of the stage only barely makes a difference, but it can still be the difference between having more or less room to work with. That is Pokin in a nutshell. It's an incredible game, a game I've fallen in love with while making this video. Of course, after the intro stuff, I was mainly talking about Pokin Tournament DX, which is the Nintendo Switch re-release we got on September 22nd, 2017. Even then, Pokin was and still is a great game that you should give a try. In the description, I've left some links, including info about support Pokemon, the Pokin character compendium I used as a reference, and of course a link to the Pokin community Discord. Feel free to at me in the matchmaking channel. I'm always happy to run a set or two, but just know I won't always be able to play, which is where the rest of the community comes in. As always, I'm Silver, thank you for watching, and remember to always blame the lag.